Aloha mai kako. And mahalo for the great privilege of being here amongst friends and colleagues and ohana, decision makers, a whole bunch of folks. It's, it's a real privilege for me to be here. Mahalo. I stand before you today, as Kelly mentioned, not as a scientist like my esteemed colleague, but as, um, but as an attorney who's been working, and as a Kanaka Maori attorney in particular, who's been working on issues of environmental stewardship and really the tension between natural resource ownership and management for over a decade or so. As Kelly E. mentioned, I've assisted rural and predominantly Kanaka Maoli communities in working to protect and restore their natural and cultural resources and to secure access to fresh water in particular. And like many folks in our community, I wear lots of different hats. Um, Kelly E. mentioned some of them, and this has been the context that's informed um, the work that I do today. So not just years of litigation at Earth Justice or even teaching at Kahuliao or directing the Environmental Law Clinic, but I think probably most importantly, uh, my upbringing on Kauai in a rural Maoli community and kind of, and really growing up, fortunately, being able to live Maoli culture and seeing what that's like and how that needs to inform how we move forward. But a big part of my work has been really partnering with communities who are seeking to restore Makutumakai stream flow and also to protect their groundwater resources for environmental, cultural, and other benefits. Um, and for me, that work has really, as I mentioned, exposed the tension between whether our resources um, are stewarded or, and, and treated as um, a resource, or whether they're actually treated as someone's private property. And that's been a huge issue for us. Now, Malia has asked us to talk a little bit about the importance of resource stewardship. And for us as Kanaka Maoli, I mean, that's just part of our DNA, literally. And everyone knows the story of Papa and Wakea, and there's many different versions, and this is the one slide version that is kind of, that's really, as complex and, and as deep as it should be, but it's what I can cover in my, in my 10 minutes. And I think it, it, for me, just underscores, you know, that where we come from, and that really Papa and Wakea came together, and, um, and they gave birth to our islands. And that after some of our islands were born, then Wakea had a child with Ho'ohoku Kalani. And that child was stillborn, but where they buried it outside of the Hale, a kala plant group, which became the staple food of our people. And then they had another child. And this child was the first Kanaka Maoli, the first one of us born here in these islands. And so that really establishes for me both the physical and the spiritual relationship to our aina and creates the kuleana that William talked about earlier to really malama our natural and cultural resources, not just for us, but as a public trust for future generations as well. And so for us as Maori, really, resource stewardship is, is our worldview. And our traditional systems of resource management, as we all know here, um, were really intricate and inter interdependent. But the core of that, for me, was really the kuleana, the balance between the privilege and the responsibility of taking care of this place to make sure that our people can persevere into the future. And I think William addressed that you know, best. It's not just where we come from, but I think that really has to inform where and how we go forward into the future. And I think for the general public, for folks who are not Malu, well, this ethic of resource stewardship benefits you too, because as people living in islands in the middle of the Pacific, like Chip showed us with all this stuff going on around us, um, this is going to determine um, how we can stay here and persevere. And as we all heard in a really kind of depressing way when Chip was talking earlier, but things are changing fast. And this is an example of the difference between my understanding of global warming and Chip's. Um, <laughs> this is a very simple, simple approach to it. <laughs> but the facts are the facts, you know? Our rainfall is decreasing. What does that mean? Our groundwater flow. Yeah, just being honest, everybody. <laughs> our stream discharge, our stream flows are decreasing. What are we? What are we also seeing? Sea levels is rising, and our ocean is becoming more and more acidic. This is scary for us as people who live off the land and who require that to perpetuate our culture. And so, for me, the fundamental question for us here today is really how is this going to impact our quality of life as Kalakamon? And what do we need to do now with all of this information in order to inform how we go forward? Well, um, for us, like so many others, we have a lot at stake. What we're seeing with our declining stream flows and the rising sea level is threats to our coastal plain agriculture. 
That's our little ikalo. I mean, that's where we perpetuate haloa and grow the food that's a staple of our people. Um, these conditions, as many folks mentioned, are also going to impact our local ia as we're seeing decreases in freshwater discharge in our near shore marine area. This water is going to become um, warmer. It's going to become, um, have more salt in it. And what's that going to mean as far as the Lumi Bay area? So, put simply, at least for me, global warming really jeopardizes our ability not just to continue living Maui culture um, in all of the different aspects. I mean, including at its core, just eating our traditional foods like fish and corn. And what we also know is that a warmer, more acidic ocean affects our coral reef, it affects our fish, our marine life, including limu, like people like my family and other people rely on in order to survive. And that's gonna mean big impacts, not just to the near shore marine ecosystem, but to the human, and other communities that rely on them in order to go forward. So, where do we go from here then? For me, it's really makahana ka'ike. I mean, the knowing is really in the doing. And for us, not just as Maori, but even for local culture, it's really, we're dependent on these resources in order for our culture, not just to survive, but really to thrive. And because of that, our identity as indigenous people is really inextricably linked to these islands and to the resources that we have. And so global warming really threatens, again, not just the resources and our ability to persist here, but really our identity as a people. And so what are some of the barriers? And this is what Lilia really asked us to focus on. What are some of the barriers that we see? Um, the environmental barriers, the cultural barriers, the policy barriers, in order to inform decision-making and better stewardship. For me, and a lot of folks have already talked about this, including Stanton and William, you know, public education. We still have folks, the deniers, we still have folks who are in disbelief, despite the fact that we're seeing water spots, we're having hail in Kailua. I mean, what's up with that? Something's changing quickly. And even for folks who understand the science of it or know how it's linked, I mean, there's a level of frustration that no matter what we do here as a community, what's gonna happen in a respectful way so people can understand what does this mean for Kaunakakai? for Kona, for Kalihibai, for all of these different areas. What is this gonna mean and how are we gonna be able to deal with this? And so I think one of the major barriers is understanding and getting that information out. But for me, an even bigger barrier based on some of the work that I've been doing lately within the last decade or so, really looks at this tension between whether our resources are public resources and they're used to benefit the larger community and looking at the environmental and cultural benefits or whether they're treated as private property and they're continuing to be taken for private use. And I see this coming to fruition um, in the mass appropriation of our public resources. And for me, because of the work that I've done, I mean, this really comes to bear in looking at the management of our freshwater resources in particular. Um, these resources, resources have been appropriated for at least the last 150 years or so, um, and managed for the financial bottom line, not for environmental or cultural sustainability or resiliency. And so, what does this mean? Well, we've got people taking money out of our bank account for the last 150 years, and nobody's making a deposit. And so, we're seeing the impacts of that now. So I think one of the important things that we need to do is keep water flowing from Mauka to Makai. You know, whether that's above ground in our streams, whether that's below ground in our aquifers, but we really need to recharge into Malama our groundwater supplies that provide the principal source of drinking water for Hawaii's most populated communities. Because this is gonna, I mean, that's our safety net. That's what's gonna help to provide um, buffer in times of the job. And we all know as practitioners and as people who are from this place, the importance of fresh water flowing into our Mulibai area. Um, but, you know, whether that's from streams or from coastal springs, what we're seeing now based on some of the research that is happening is that's important, <coughs> not just to support the cycle of life, but that helps to provide a buffer against, um, and the cold, fresh water coming either from underground or from our streams can help to provide a buffer against coral bleaching. And so that's important for us too. So we need to look at how is that connected. Unfortunately, over 90% of our streams in Hawaii have at least one diversion on them. So most of our, and many of them, it's not just taking like small kind of water from what you call and then putting it back. Whole systems are being diverted. Um, and even though most of our plantations are closed now, we only have one left in Hawaii, instead of putting that water back where it belongs, um, these corporations are spinning off limited liability corporations, and now that water is being sold to fuel urban development, as opposed to looking at what the environmental and cultural benefits need to be for the larger community. 
So, uh, you know, this is a reality in most of our communities. Uncle Walter knows this, coming from Mali. This is Eon Stream for those folks who have been there. You know, beautiful free-flowing stream, but you have this diversion grade that goes right across it. And so for miles, Makai of that. We have nothing but dry rocks. And so what does that mean as far as um, recharging our groundwater supplies for all of the different benefits? That's a huge issue. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, so good news, I have one good news slide. <laughs> I think the good news is that we have some of the tools that we need to begin to address these issues. In Hawaii, we have really strong public trust provisions and other legal handles that we can use to implement place-based planning in order to address the changes that not only are happening now, but more changes that are going to be coming down the line. And, you know, Chip talked about some of these. We can do building setbacks. We can change our building code. I think we also really need to look at pono um, management of our water resources. And that means for me, um, we need to be really proactive in strengthening and restoring our ecosystems. So repairing our existing systems and planning for changes that are going to come. You know, if we have more healthy systems, we're gonna, that's going to create resiliency in our community so that we can persevere in times of drought. But that's not going to happen if all of our water keeps being taken um, for urban development or other issues. So, unfortunately, I think another huge problem is um, lack of action by decision makers. And I was really inspired by what William had to say today. And I'm hopeful, despite my many years of working with the Department of <laughs> Natural Resources <laughs> and the Water Commission in particular, that um, hopefully this vision and philosophy can trickle down into you know, the other folks who are on the ground managing and can really inspire that action because I think the apathy has been a major issue. But I think the solution is here um, with the people in the communities. That it's really us, the communities who are standing in harm's way, who really have to step up and embrace our kulana and to really effectuate better stewardship. And I think that means a whole range of things. We can support data collection. Everybody knows that Chip was talking about all the great stuff that's happening. But I think where necessary, we also need to look at how we can use litigation as a tool in order to help um, these agencies do their jobs, but I think more important to protect our quality of life and the things that make Hawaii truly special. So, at least in some communities, Hawaii, the water's returning, but we still have um, much more work to do. So, mahalo.